Epiphany has been all about light, right? Light. And we talk about it as bringing the light into the world, Christ being the light of the world. Now we're at the end of the Epiphany season. We're at the Sunday that is called Transfiguration Sunday. This month it happens to fall on the very same day as Communion as well. So that's kind of a good serendipitous happenstance because Transfiguration has to do with transformation. And for us, communion is something that helps us to be transformed. Now, Transfiguration Sunday is not one of those Sundays of the year like Easter or Christmas. Uh, it's not really up there with Advent and Lent and Pentecost. So it's not something that everybody always is like, oh yeah, I know what that's about. I got it. I, know, I, I don't even need to go. I know what Transfiguration Sunday is about. Sometimes people don't really know or get it. And it's kind of a strange story, the one that we heard Virginia tell. Transfiguration is the last stop before Lent. Lent begins this week on Ash Wednesday. But what's it about? What is it that we're commemorating or celebrating or talking about? Well, what it celebrates is the transfiguration of Jesus. And what that means is that now that true nature, all Jesus' divinity, all his godliness is revealed. Suddenly seen, momentarily seen, while he was still here on earth as a human being walking with us, with Peter, James, and John. Just a brief moment. <coughs> now, some of us might not get the impact of that from experiences in our own lives or from standing here. So I thought of a few stories, a few examples that you might relate to, to exactly how impressive this was. Any of you ever watched Star Trek? <laughs> There's a couple of episodes, various times in Star Trek, where Captain Kirk is having conversations with some wise being from some other planet or some other galaxy or something. And the being is manifesting itself as maybe a rock or another humanoid of some kind. And after a while, we find out that that's not the being's actual appearance. That's not the way they really look. And when Captain Kirk asks them why they won't appear in their true selves, what is it they're trying to hide, they say that they don't appear as their true self because it would be too much for Captain Kirk to handle or for any human to handle. That it would be too intense, too bright, too frightening perhaps, all of these things. And there have been a couple episodes where they actually did give him a glimpse. And he was like, oh, that, never mind, you're right, go back to that other, you know, I, I, you're blinding me, you know, kind of thing. That, that's how intense that was. It's not quite like The Wizard of Oz and The Man Behind the Curtain, because that was disappointing. You know, it was just this little you know, frog-like man behind the curtain not doing anything, except madly pulling levers. God's kind of the opposite. You know, 
God is the giant Oz that was being said there. We have all of these myths in our society about we've got these giant un, ununderstandable beings. And just for a moment, Peter, James, and John saw that godliness and that light and that divine power of God within Jesus. Now, just before this, in the week, week ahead of this little trip up the mountain, Jesus had been explaining to all of his apostles and disciples that hard times were coming. He'd been telling them that he was going to be betrayed. He'd been telling them that he was going to die, that he was going to be crucified. He'd been explaining to them that there were some tough times ahead and that they were going to have to continue on. He told them that he wasn't going to leave them without comfort. He told them he was going to give them a Holy Spirit. But he told them, you are going to have to soldier on. I will be gone. I will be ascended to the Father, but I will have been crucified. And all of that was pretty uncomfortable for the disciples. They were talking about all of it. And in one of the conversations, Jesus asked the disciples, who are people saying that I am? Who do they say that I am? And the disciples told him, well, some people say you're a prophet. Some people say you're John the Baptist resurrected. Some people say you are Elijah come again. Some people say you are Moses. But then Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? That's an important question. We're being asked that question every moment. Peter's answer is, you are the Messiah, the Christ. And this is the first time that he makes that claim. He continues to tell them that we have a cross to carry. We ourselves, after his cross, we have our own cross. And what is that? It is our task. It is our challenge. It is whatever it is we have to do to stay faithful to God and to carry out and share God's love. So not even a week after all of that heavy duty stuff, they go up the mountain. Oh, let's go camping. Let's have a trip up on the mountain. Anybody like to go camping? Or used to like to go camping? <laughs> used to like. You know, I used to love to go to a summer camp. Now, of course, I think I had a couple of years of Girl Scout camp, but mostly they were summer music camps. But those were really high points. They, they probably, because of all the exciting things I got to do with those camps, made me like camping even more than just going out on a tent with friends. Because these were exciting times. Mountaintop experiences. Just wonderful times. So this is what Peter, James, and John get to do with Jesus. They get to go up to the top of this mountain. And then not only do they get to go up to the top of the mountain with Jesus, these are their, his, his closest buddies, right? They get to see Elijah and Moses, too, along with Jesus. I mean, talk about exciting. Now... In the story, Elijah represents something for us more than a guy standing up there on the mountain. Elijah represents a certain part of the whole past belief, of the whole Jewish belief. He represents the prophets. He represents prophecy. And Moses, he has a job to represent as well. Moses represents the law. Remember the Ten Commandments? We just heard about him going up to the mountain. He got a burning bush at least. Oh. Um, so we have two pieces of God's revelation. We have prophecy and law. Jesus is the third piece. He is the fulfillment of those things. Now, Peter, who's poor Peter, he is often portrayed as sort of a bumbling idiot. You know, he, he makes big mistakes. Well, I will never betray you. Oh, no, I don't know him. I don't know him. I will never betray him. Three times he betrays him. You know, he has to go pay the tax collector with the coin, and he's like, what do you mean get the coin out of a fish? 
guys should look up that story sometime. But, um, yeah, poor Peter. So he doesn't know what to say. They're a little bit intimidated by you know, Moses and Elijah being there and Jesus all in this bright white light. But they're loving it. It's exciting and intense. So Peter, being Peter, says, I know. I'll build some huts. And we can just stay up here in this exciting and intense and wonderful, glorious time. We can just stay here. This is great. This is good for us. Let's just stay here where it's all fun and games, where it's all exciting. Let's stay at camp all year. But right about then, God says, this is my son with a you know, big voice of God comes down in the story. And then Moses and Elijah are gone, and it's just the four dudes. And they come on down the mountain. They have to come down the mountain. And they have to listen to Jesus. Jesus tells them, don't blab about this until after the resurrection, by the way. You know I told you, there's going to be a crucifixion and the resurrection. Then you can tell everybody about experiencing the holiness of God and that. But if you do it now, they're just going to think you're crazy. So just wait until the big moment happens. The whole thing is a pretty strange story. You know, it's just, it's really odd. But what I see from it is this excitement and energy of the mountaintop. And we want to stay in there. Probably the people going to the Oscars later today and getting their awards, they want to stay in that bevy of excitement. <coughs> we all have our things that we do, you know? I mean, the musicians, a couple of them are here today, when we have a big concert here with the orchestra, after week after week after week, we work hard carrying our crosses, right? We work hard doing all of that. We finally get to the concert, and it's usually pretty exciting, kind of an adrenaline rush, you know, when you get through. And you want to always have it that way, to have to come back after it. Two or three weeks later, you're starting over. All new music, nobody knows what they're doing, everybody's lost, nobody knows what, you know, it's drudgery. But it takes us to a glorious reward. We want to stay in that glory. But we get to come down and work. In some ways, we can relate other than just with music. Sometimes we come here together and we spend wonderful time together. You know, warm, fuzzy time or sudden glorious inspiration excitement and fellowship. Or we just look up at the ceiling and say, wow, what a gorgeous ceiling. And we want to stay in that where we're comfortable. But we can't. We're growing and changing every day. New people, new energy, <clears throat> chores to do around town chores to do right here in the building. You know, we come together on Sunday and we enjoy it, but we gotta come back during the week, on the weekend or come early or stay late and make the place wonderful to be in again. A lot of times like Peter, we don't want the high energy, high excitement to end. We want to keep it. And we want to share it. But when we share it, we invite change. Even if it's something as simple as someone comes into our fellowship and we make room and we make sure things are nice for them by welcoming them and by keeping stuff nice so people can enjoy their time here. 
Those are simple little changes, but they are some work. <coughs> There's a minister by the name of Dan Kimball, and he wrote a book called They Like Jesus But Not the Church. And in the book, he writes about some research that he did, and it shows that a lot of people that are outside the church, not just this church, any church, have a great opinion of Jesus and his life and his message, but they have a bad opinion of Christians, finding them to be hypocritical and judgmental and sometimes sheltered. And he theorizes about it, and he concludes that without meaning to, sometimes Christians are like pretty scenes trapped in a beautiful snow globe. This is his, his words. We live in a bubble and we like it there and we want to stay there. We tend to mostly interact with, live near, and spend time with people who are like us and who share our beliefs. Instead of being the church, the body of Christ, we focus on the church as a place where we might invite people to come. But we're unlikely to bring church, Christ, to them. And so it's hard to reach others from inside the bubble. I'm not saying that we are like that here. I'm saying that we have to be careful not to become like that here. I'm saying we have to continue to work and to share and to open up. I have seen and been inspired by just about every single one of you here. You're welcoming your work, your outreach, just plain sharing and being here. Some of you deal with struggles every single day that I can't imagine. Some health problems, some personal things, some business things. We all have tough things that we deal with. And we come here to be safe and happy and fuzzy and warm. And we get that a lot. But the next thing is, get out there and work and share it. I hope you can kind of relate to that a little bit, to the bubble that we want to be in and the hard work it is to go out and share it. We want to trap our holy, beautiful experience thing in the bubble and keep it. Gollum and his precious. Yeah, we want to keep it, but we can't. We have to share it. I mean, what would have happened if Jesus just stayed up on the mountain with the disciples? Or if Moses couldn't tear himself away from the burning bush? What if Mary Magdalene stayed at the tomb with Jesus and didn't go out and share the good news that Jesus had risen? And what if the shepherds and the Magi couldn't tear themselves away from the manger? Like, oh, this is cool. Let's just stay here. What if I'd stayed at summer music camp my whole life? instead of doing other things to moving on from it and growing. The holy places, the exciting places in our lives, they're, they're wonderful and precious and energizing and exciting. But we can't bottle them up. We have to let them out. Maybe we can shake the bottle and have a wonderful spray of holiness. When we talk about faith, and we've been talking about that lately, when we talk about faith, it's not something static that stays in one place. Faith is a journey. Faith is something that moves and grows. And if it doesn't, it's dead. We worship a God whose name is, in Hebrew, I am. And the living God, active God, a God who's doing a new thing all the time. So we're called to continue doing and growing and living. Maybe we can relate at Bethel in the midst of all of our transitions that we would like to stay just safe and cozy and happy. But 
you know, our experiences together as we grow and share, each one becomes more and more and more of a mountaintop, higher and higher. We open ourselves to hear God speaking to us by climbing up that mountain and by climbing back down into the world. So what happens after this transfiguration on the mountaintop? What happens next? They climb down the mountain. They start living their lives, picking up their crosses, doing their chores, feeding the hungry. But they have been transformed. They have been changed by that experience of the mountaintop. There is no way that you can experience God and not have some kind of a change in your life. If you're a Harry Potter fan at all, you know that at Hogwarts, there was an entire section of the curriculum devoted to transfiguration. And in Harry Potter, what that was about was magically changing form and appearance of something. Like turning a bird into a goblet or something like that. Learning how to transform the outward appearance of one object into another. But being truly transfigured transformed within, that's a much more difficult matter. It's why we come here and we join together on a lifelong journey of discovery, trial, error, restarts. It's why we work together to learn. It's why we come to Bible study to study about faith and prayer and forgiveness. It's why we come to share communion to confess for ourselves and to think for ourselves and to accept that gift of transformation that is offered to us. And in accepting it, agreeing to share it with absolutely everyone. Amen. Okay.